uh, help my paid search campaigns that flatlined. In this webinar, I'm going to go over some common reasons why your campaigns may have started out and gone strong, but how to use competitive intelligence to kickstart those campaigns back to life. We're going to discuss some overall root causes for stagnation, new ways to consider the data we're seeing, and some actionable steps to take along the way to right the ship. So, digital performance, as we know very well, can stagnate in many, many ways. And if you, I want to highlight a couple of reasons why you may be in a competitive blind spot. If you're attending this webinar, you've gone through the quick checks and need to explain or justify why your campaigns are generating fewer leads or overall conversions are down. With a robust competitive intelligence strategy, you'll have insights on how to determine if your decline is truly related to seasonality or if something else is going on. Without historical data and importantly, historical context, you may see declines without the necessary larger view perspective. Product offering stasis could be a real reason why your campaigns are gathering dust, a lack of changes, meaning fewer updates to the campaign with a, a set and forget mentality. But on the inverse, constant iteration and changes may mean that you're not collecting the information you're needing. New and, comp new and aggressive competitors in the space, particularly if you work on finance, may be your, your undoing as well. It is very possible that your campaigns are performing admirably and you'd be on the up and up, but a new VC-funded company has moved into the space and disrupted everything. If a Leviathan like Amazon moves into your marketing budget space, it may not be your campaigns are flatlining, but they're just being squished down by Jeff Bezos. So understanding the nature of why your sales are down, first step to understanding how you can bring life back to those campaigns. Very broadly, my goal today is to pull back the current on competitive intelligence and show how the data science is a missing part of your page search strategy. Competitive intelligence is more about simply knowing what company A is bidding on or competitor B starting a new promotion, but a much broader market view approach provided by these entities. It should be the whole iceberg, not just the tip of it that we're considering. At Athena, we define competitive intelligence for search as the ability to understand your competitor's Google ad strategies on a granular and continual basis. It makes the patterns, pricing, and bidding strategies of your market competition transparent, including ad copy, imagery, and other tactical elements of the campaign. There are a few terms here that I really like to highlight. One is granular, rather than just the industry view level. If industry level view CPCs are 50 cents, but yours are a dollar, that doesn't really help much. If you need to have, you need to have deep intelligence to see what's really moving that needle. The second word here is continual. Spot checking competitor ads is just competitive trivia. It's a single fact. It's nice to know and potentially get a temperature check of what we're going to do with that information, but what are we gonna do with it now that we have it? It makes for a nice report, but doesn't inform your strategy completely. The last term I'd like to highlight is transparent. CI is about accountability. It's about making your competition, and in many ways, Google more transparent. With this definition now in check, how are we gonna use CI to breathe back life into our campaigns? And this is the area that I want to highlight about how we at Athena do it. This is just probably the only time I'll kind of be discussing what we do. Athena solutions are powered by our whole market view technology, where it's gonna be a dynamic AI-driven data model that's gonna be unique for each advertiser, representing their entire relevant search landscape. With our patented machine learning technology, the whole market view is gonna provide that comprehensive data scope and the quality required by you, the leading advertisers in your space, to precisely assess competitive opportunities at scale across your entire market without limitations. We do this in a multi-step process, beginning by indexing your entire sitemap and scraping your website for relevant content that your SEO strategy is about. Your content marketing is going to help be informed and inform your paid search strategies. From there, we're building out a keyword universe based from your website and Google Ads data. With this information in tow, we then just start to query this information and collect all of your competitors that we find with SERP as well, see what they're advertising on, see what their content market strategy is, and collecting this information to build a single search term universe. Now, not only are we looking at the terms that we want to monitor, we're also monitoring our competitors as well. We then make this relevant down to you, pulling all of this information into ways that you can really start to move the needle. Competitive insight is involved in evolving process, and which is why Athena lives on the SERP. In this quote from Chris Basio, the director of marketing and biz dev from Goldberg Cohen, he has this quote about how competitive intelligence can get the ball rolling. He says, show stakeholders how competitive intelligence can improve their understanding of their current business, and you'll soon find them asking to work on more strategic and complex projects. It creates a larger, more holistic approach to your business practices in this ever updating way. As we make time to keep up with Google, like their little update of the favicon and ad icon display on desktop that was just two weeks ago where they 
changed the placement of the landing page URL to the top and they made organic results even more indistinguishable from ads, they're updating a lot and changing things and your strategy needs to be changing and updating with them. Good competitive intelligence will also tell you more about your business than will your competitors. So for the grand finale, let's go ahead and hop into the agenda today. Today we're gonna to be talking about seven ways to jumpstart your paid campaigns after a flat line. We're gonna be discussing conversion monitoring, how to rethink your A-B testing strategy, best practices for capturing movements and trends, keyword research strategy, ad copy analysis, how to work smarter, and then the best ways to maintain brand control. With that, let's go ahead and hop right into the first one about complete tracking. So we're going to discuss a variety of actionable items to start doing in the campaigns and really get into the weeds of Google Ads. But before we do, we need to tidy up the accounts a little bit. Our first handful of agenda points will be about the holistic business settings that may explain why your conversion metrics are flat. With that, incomplete tracking and outdated conversion actions should be the first thing to consider. Ensuring that your campaign settings and direct conversions actions are aligned with your core results. Your KPIs that are driving trials instead of conversions or lead gen opportunities may be diminishing otherwise to find or converting pages. Conversion tracking spring cleaning, especially with multi-channel attribution is now crucial. So we need to know where the customer journey is, where they're converting, and through proper goal tracking and to monitor site drop off properly. So our easiest solution is just doing a bit of spring cleaning. As the parable goes, if you have six hours to cut down a tree, you should spend the first four hours sharpening the ax. So in order to have the greatest impact, it's best to spend some time cleaning out the account and ensuring that the work you're doing is going to be built on a strong, clean foundation. This means that a campaign cleanup of your conversion actions and spending a bit of time investigating a core settings that you probably recently have engaged with. If you've had a handful of agencies come through your account or worked in-house, it's time to ensure that the conversion action across these different departments is going to be aligned after those changes. So first and foremost, ensure that your direct conversion actions are aligned with your core results. What is that main conversion action? Is it the lead? Is it a trial signup? Is it an e-commerce checkout? Ensure that you don't have cluttered conversion actions that are potentially creating double takes, raising those CPAs, or those campaigns that have include in all conversions. Conversion tracking spring cleaning, especially with multi-channel attribution, knowing where that customer journey is converting through proper goal tracking, creates a bigger picture of how your clients are engaging with your site, reacting to, and then ultimately utilizing your website. The second challenge I'd like to discuss today is flaws of A-B testing. And I really should clarify this and say, this is probably flaws of manual A-B testing. And this is probably gonna be one of my more controversial slides, but it's gonna at least raise the most eyebrows. So I'm, I'm discussing this information from Martin Rodgerding and uh, his blog, PPC Epiphany. Um, anyone with Google shopping experience is gonna recognize Martin name. It's, he completely changed the game and went as the leader about tiered and priority level shopping ad uh, campaign structures. Martin is the head of SEM at Blue Fusion out of Germany. And for the full story of what I'm gonna to discuss today, you can check out his literally award-winning presentation from HeroCon London a few years back. And this is the overall crux of the argument on manual A-B testing. He says that A-B testing is going to lead to a result that we want, not one that is necessarily correct based on where we draw that finish line. If you keep asking, are these results significant yet? Have we reached 95% yet? Again and again and again, you're eventually gonna get the yes answer that you're looking for, and stop asking. Martin very aptly includes a link to a Simpsons cartoon clips where Bart and Lisa are asking Homer to go to a water park. Ad infinitum, can we go yet, can we go yet, can we go yet, and Homer eventually relents. Not taking no for an answer is going to lead you down a very particular path and one that isn't necessarily correct all the time. The highlight of his test was, and spoilers, he tested identical ads and eventually reached SigFig, that one ad was statistically better than the other despite being the text being completely identical. It wasn't an A-B test, it was an A-A test. These told us the one ad was better than the other, but we know that's not necessarily true. They were exactly the same. But what that does tell us, it tells us more about the testing me method than the ads themselves. So with that, there's a lot of information we need to consider. Um, we should think about how significance of ads comes and goes. That if we stop at 95%, we don't really wait for that reverb. In an extreme answer, uh, a Black Friday ad is going to perform better than a standard text ad in the same space, 
But after a weekend, that information is going to change despite click-through rates historically have been better. It's not that these tests were flawed per se, it's just it's kind of a bit of a moot point. So here are our solutions to this. The solution to this revelation of sorts is to change it up slightly. Martin concludes his blog, which is a multi-part essay worth to read on its own from PPC Epiphany again. He says, the way that we use statistical significance in ad testing is designed to get us the answers that we want, not the answer that is correct. That doesn't mean that the answer will always be wrong, but it means that the whole exercise is pointless. You can base your decisions on reaching those 95%, but the numbers are inconsequential. Calculating statistical significance simply doesn't add value, and that's right. It's a pretty strong mic drop moment with a lot of data that backs it up. But what does this mean for us? Well, it means that we need to reevaluate our testing methods to ensure that we're going about it in the right way and that the decisions that we're making will drive ultimate value. His database uh, is on performance of significance over time for text ads, so you don't need to throw out optimizely with the bath bar just yet. You just need to pivot your approach. Utilize automation and tools to smooth this process out. Google's optimized performance is the easiest first step. And I'd be really interested to see if anyone in the chat is still using Rotate Evenly or some other type of rotation schedule. Google has become very, very good about recognizing the customer journey, kind of a sub theme for this webinar, and it's completely fine to lean into their results. A big point too is that you need to get out of the weeds and focus on what you do best, which really net resonates with your client personas versus the complete micromanagement of uh, testing one little ad versus the next. Challenge number three, capturing movements and trends. And this is a big one from our first poll. A complete competitive insight visualization is going to give you the necessary visibility to determine who's making moves within your space and how that's going to affect your campaigns. Market entries and exits are gonna have many, many side effects. Sometimes a, a market exit, a vacuum, is gonna create new opportunities or explain why traffic spiked over particular turns or someone moving into the space is going to justify your stagnated results. But these explanations are provided only if you have the visibility to grab this information quickly and run with it. Observation and temperature checks to understand the whole market view is crucial. Visualizing that are broadly will keep you from getting bogged out bogged out with the pure data, that paralysis by analysis. When growth flatlines and CTR starts to decline, Google's knee-jerk reaction, as we all know, is to increase bids if they're not already suggesting to change your campaign structure entirely. But this is only gonna go so far and it's gonna result in a nuclear arms race of bids. Your campaign structure may be perfectly attuned, but if you know that juggernaut comes in like Amazon to your space, there may not be much you can do. So monitoring these blind spots is gonna be crucial. And this is how we, go about suggesting resolving those issues. Our solution is that pure market visualization. First, try to create that whole market view so that you understand what every competitor is doing in their movements, both in and out of the space. Uh, think of you and your competition as a, as a Venn diagram with shared keywords in the middle. Having visibility on the other side of the Venn diagram, that, that unshaded part is gonna be useful. Is that unshaded part decreasing? Are they doubling down into the shared keywords? Are they gonna be in more direct competition with you by being in more direct options? Or is that outside growing? Are they splintering off into new markets and product lines? Use tools and visualize this data. It's the easiest way to identify trends and market shifts at a grand scale. So even if you're just flipping your raw data into Excel or using something a little bit more robust showing week over week data or month over month trend lines, this is going to allow you to start making high level strategic decisions and be the guiding line of where you need to focus your work. By looking at that top level view of seeing what's fluctuating over time, you can then get into the nitty gritty details as necessary. A bit of a curveball for our next options for market trends is to keep an eye on what the youngbloods of the industry are doing. One indicator is to follow VC investments and stay alert with what some new players are doing. And this is gonna be particularly cogent for anybody who's working in a big industry that hasn't seen a lot of change recently. And, you know, it's possible that you flatline campaigns are easy to explain by sheer market saturation. You're, you are everywhere, you're stable, you're just not showing growth anymore. What you can do is monitor the people who are growing, those new players in the space, you may be able to eke out some new possibilities of what their current business model is by monitoring where the funding is going. By just chasing the money up the tree, we can see exactly what the new players are doing. A prime example in the um, finance space is Lemonade, who's been around for less than five years at this point. While the juggernauts of the industry are staying stagnant, 
Now someone's moving into this space. Let's see what they're doing. Let's see what their ad copy messaging is doing. And we can follow along with them. Lastly, to this point, is follow along some industry guides and data. So when you're lacking, at least get a proper, proper temperature gauge of what your competitors are doing and how to move forward. And this is where we're going to get into the weeds a little bit and start talking about some keyword action that we can start to do. So let's go ahead and look at ways we can increase your keyword strategy and grow out that list a little bit. So from the theoretical cleanup of conversion actions and monitoring trends, let's go ahead and get into the practical application. So dreaded keyword research. I've done it, we've done it, we've all spent so much time living in the bloody keyword planner. The challenges of it are quite apparent. It's gonna be limiting, a bit time intensive, and your competitors may be using the same tools or using tools that you're not. And furthermore, you may simply be set. You may need something a little bit bigger in scope than what the keyword planner can, can provide. A metaphor that I use for the keyword planner is like having horse blinders on. It gives you a view that you already know but not something off the beaten path, those opportunities that may fall outside of its general scope. The common issue in strategic decision has been about that symbiotic relationship between paid and organic and letting your customers find you via the free click, which means that you could be overspending on terms you're already going to acquire the customer for. You may face challenges over your pure brand terms. Those longer tail brand terms, the brand generics, may have greater competition as challengers try to sweep up the dregs of those long tail options. And another great challenge is budgeting for this expansion. If you recognize new terms, new markets to acquire, what forecasting can be done to ensure that you're going to be spending effectively and efficiently? So here are some solutions we've provided for you. So uh, solutions for the whole market goes back to that whole market necessity to have total insights on uh, the gaps and unique opportunities that are going to be presented to you. When your SEM campaigns have completely flatlined, the change from plateau to growth is going to be best eked out by going wide and not pushing vertically. Trying to push yourself up the SERP by pushing your competition down is going to be rough going, but you can be more strategic in moving beyond niche market keywords relevant to the jargon of your business to test new opportunities, new colloquialisms, new user speech to analyze and scale your business in new ways. Pictured here along with our handy cowboys, the need to tackle lone rangers. Athena refers to Lone Rangers as the terms where you're on the top organic spot and you are the only competitor in paid search. Not that you show up more than often or you've got a higher position, but literally the terms where you are the only sole advertiser in the auction. This means that you're paying for a click when you could be letting organic win that. Now there's a lot of reasons to keep those Lone Rangers. You get to own the scroll, you've got the mobile real estate, but unless those CPCs are at the bottom of the barrel, you can reallocate that spend into more competitive terms and keep position on pennies on the dollar. We're going to speak a little bit more about brand later in the presentation, so I'm just going to quickly say to investigate competition on brand generics to determine if anyone else is sneaking in at that um, automatic level. You won't be able to feasibly spot check trademark infringements manually without doing the exercise without the entire exercise of checking these terms, costing more uh, worker hours than it's going to give back. Our next big challenge to discuss is ad copy analysis. In our little pre-webinar questionnaire, this was one problem area where many of you say you spend a lot of your time. Using the ad preview tool is taxing. It's a manual process to perform either the search, which is either not sustainable, to, to capture the copy, analyze it, and repeat this process again and again. And once you have the data, what next? How do you shift your value offerings based on this new information? We know the limitations of descriptions and how little wiggle room we have to stand out, and, and that's with just core brand terms. Long tail queries can add even more complexity. Um, niche location targeting, missing out on audience targeting. There's gonna be a lot of factors that we try to manage when it comes to ad copy analysis. What we have here are a few steps to hopefully kind of overcome some of those biggest issues. We talked a little bit earlier about data visualization to determine high level market trends, and that is something I've done in the past with ad copy. Using the preview tool, this is something that, again, is very personal to me, is I've collected competitor ad copy, and I've thrown this data into Notepad or Excel. And from there, even, either using Excel account formulas, or lately, I use word cloud generators. I just input this raw data and use these free platforms to deliver intelligence that's a little bit easier for me to manage. Uh, not only does it create a nice report for my higher-ups, but I can very quickly see if the term free trial or save or a dollar sign is large and bold and appearing more often than other value propositions that I'm seeing. 
their call to actions, their credibility terms, is all made a little bit more apparent and visible by taking this raw data and changing the format of it. When it comes to the ad copy refresh, there's gonna be three real paths to take. You can start mimicking your competition and saying if their, if their performance is doing particularly well. You can say something completely different. And lastly, you can just move out of that space entirely if you can't compete. Ad copy is gonna follow those three paths. Mimic what they're doing, do the complete opposite, or simply run away. It's completely valid to recognize when you can't win on a seasonal value proposition and put your money elsewhere. A specialized retreat, if, if you know it's gonna work, when you can't compete, it's gonna be more effective for the greater capital B budget. For the e-commerce listeners around here, if you're running non-smart shopping feeds and you still have search, search query data, that little tab that they took away from us, you can use your PLA campaigns to pull in long tail information and then let either PBC or feeds uh, win those long tail queries um, based on your conversion data. Our next big challenge is, is working with Google's smart campaigns. So this is an unsurprising and unexpected change in the space, but forces us to reevaluate the usual day-to-day. Uh, -day. Not only are more metrics and data being removed from this view, uh, such as the search queries from the shopping ads I just mentioned, or the much discussed change of average position, but we're also being railroaded into very specific paths and in order to use certain new functionality, we've got to hop on board. It causes a dramatic shift in the amount of control we have, including changes to your detailed reporting. And this is why we often see marketers double down on those micro adjustments, those small tests. It allows the specialist to handily say, these are the changes we made, but we need them to offer some solutions that are really going to how to overcome that. So Capital Smarter, we of course are trying to be as punny as possible. But the solution is to really lean into it. We're talking about using all of Google's new smart campaigns. Google rewards early adopters. And if you follow some of the deeper threads on Twitter's PPC chat, you're gonna find a common audience of other SEM strategists who are gonna find early wins and then plateaued growth and wins and declines in a cycle of normalcy back to their new campaign just about. You can save on CPCs quickly, you can feed the beast with new information, and you can beat this competition to the punch a little bit. So because of my e-commerce background, the adoption of smart shopping campaigns is gonna be top of mind to me. It was Pretty scary when it was announced or taking away a lot of our control, but in testing, we found a lot of new opportunities. So it's great to run these campaigns, these smart campaigns alongside your previously structured accounts. Google's become exceedingly good, exceedingly good at recognizing where customers are on their journey. So when they land on your PLA, that incentive to show your ads gonna be a lot greater if they know which step of the process they're in. So give Google the most relevant and accurate and relevant uh, information possible, and you're gonna be in a great spot. Uh, when it comes back to PLAs, we've seen this information by between the switch of priority from Google's product category to the product type. The latter, which uses um, that modular, you can add whatever you want there. Now they're using your semantic tax taxonomy to inform the depth of their product offerings. So rather than school book bags being bucketed into luggage as they were in the past or camping equipment, now it's gonna be in a much more appropriate group. And then lastly, I've talked a lot about manual A-B testing so far, so I don't want to rehash that, but I always want to keep in mind of always having a responsive ad in all of your ad groups, if you're not already. I imagine every single person listening in currently is, but it's now a formalized best practice by Google, and the inner workings of that overlap aren't going to be fully known yet, so always have that little ABR testing going on. And lastly, for our final challenge that we want to discuss today is brand protection. This is probably it's, you know, just massive um, for everybody. Um, this is the thing that will kind of keep us up at night. So having visibility on core brand terms 24 hours a day is just a Herculean task. And keeping competitors out of that space is an unending one as well. The keywords that are driving the highest qualified audience who know what they want, where to get it, but upstarts and aggressive competitors are your brand bidding or worse yet, they're infringing on your trademark. With conversions on brand terms happening at two times the rate, it's gonna be crucial not to disrupt the customer journey to your site with a seamless as few click as possible result. With brand protection also comes the need to monitor your affiliates and your partnerships, and even cross brands. Friendly fire amongst your brands could be artificially increasing your CPCs as they have been for years and having greater visibility with competitive intelligence is going to inform when you need to go on the offense and when to slow things down a little bit. So in order to keep control and stop losing sleep when your CEO is calling you at 10 p.m. 
because they're doing a bit of SERP competitive intelligence themselves and asking why someone is on top of you or why you're not being as purely relevant as you could be, it's time to kind of be the bad cop. You need to enforce your agreements, you need to keep the receipts, you need to reduce your CPCs along the way through open communication with your affiliates and with documented evidence along the way. And I'm going to reference like Hamlin's razor here, that you shouldn't ascribe actions to malice, which are easily explained by ignorance. So these may not be bad faith agreements, uh, arrangements, um, but just dusty, never quite paused campaigns that have hourly bid adjustments beyond what you expected or some specialist in a different agency accidentally went broad match. Um, to keep an eye on this wide array of possible infringements, you're going to need a little bit of help. You're going to need an AI to monitor your brand. And that just it's the reality of it. You can't be on the SERP 24 seven, but an always on tool can be. They should be leveraged that way. In positive ways, you can see brand terms fluctuate by time of day and inform other strategies down the road because of what this little robot is doing for you. So when push comes to shove, it's time to go on the offense as well. You're gonna have a better quality score for your core brand terms and be able to win these brand clicks back easier, and faster, hopefully. But when shove comes to tackle, you need to capture that evidence and ship it off to Google directly. Google still takes trademark infringements very seriously. Um, I know that little um, form that we have to submit is uh, troublesome and taxing at times, but uh, it's the best way we can uh, enforce brand monitoring. So what I recommend here is just keeping the receipts and provide the evidence link with backup so you've got that historical information when people keep popping up. But again, with Hamlin's Razor, these may not be bad faith. This may not be malicious intent. It could just be a lot of people who are broad or getting a little too jumpy. So with that, I want to turn our attention back lastly to the last seven areas that I've breezed through. So the steps to ensure that you can jump start your campaigns for your SEM campaigns is do a little bit of spring cleaning for your conversion tracking updates. Rethink how you're doing A-B testing. If you're doing that A-B testing manually, you really, really need to lean into Google's um, resources for you. Visualize your movements and trends at a holistic, industry-level level. Change the way you're doing keyword research. Leverage Google's tools, but also think about ways you can visualize this information as well. Analyze your ad copy of competitors to find some little areas that you may be able to eke out uh, greater SERP understanding. Work smarter. Lean into that word smart. Just optimize into the new campaigns, be early adopters. Google is going to reward you for it. And lastly, try to be a brand steward rather than just a brand owner. Ensure that your customers are getting the best experience from your brand as possible. And with that, I think I'll bring back Caroline in for a quick little Q&A to discuss anything that may have popped up in chat while I was just uh, breezing right through the uh, breezing right through the presentation. <laughs> Thank you, Sean. And I have to say, I think you have a voice for webinars as well. So <laughs> <laughs> um, now, as Sean said, um, we're going to answer some of the questions that were submitted during today's presentation. So we will try to get to all of them, but for any that we don't, we will follow up via email. And just as a reminder, we will be sharing the slides and the webinar recording after this webinar. So. Um, and as a reminder, you can also still submit questions through the questions pane in your attendee control panel. So, Sean, our first question, what are ways we can keep ad copy exciting with stoic brand identity? Stoic brand identity. Um, okay, so I'm going to interpret this uh, question as that this person may be in a um, B2B space, um, they may have strict uh, brand guidelines, their style guide is a little bit strict. So ways to keep it exciting. I guess that's probably just an inverse of how can I be particularly creative? Um, something that I find to be a little bit useful when creating fresh ad copy is just that fresh, is changing that from time to time. And I think that colloquialisms and closer to semantic search is going to be more relevant as we, of course, semantic search is gonna be so, so popular. Um, I have seen great changes based on people asking questions um, uh, in their ad copy itself. That's something that's going to be a little bit stoic. I think that humor in ad copy is a dramatically overstated use. I, I know that people have had grand uh, success with it by trying to be a little humorous and sing out um, brands that had that lovely. But if you're as you're stoic, if you're trying to show greater trust, you may need to find some greater opportunities to discuss those value propositions of earning trust um, differently. 
So if every single person, as we said, is using the word trust, you should include that in your ad copy so you're staying out, but you should also flip it around as well. Uh, leveraging reviews, leveraging um, site links that go to testimonials, I think is crucial. Um, so in order to keep it exciting, it's, gonna, it's a million dollar question, of course, but what I think you should do is experiment with uh, the type of questions that you're asking, uh, like literally like using questions in your ad copy to see if you can help resolve uh, issues for the account. Okay, great. Thank you, Sean. Uh, okay, so next question here. Um, what is Athena's point of view on Google removing average position from advertiser reporting and metrics? Oh, we absolutely love it. Uh, we still capture this information based on how we uh, observe our data. Um, this is only problematic, I think, for a lot of people's reporting. I, I know that a lot of people probably weren't using average position as a metric. It was a temperature gauge. It wasn't necessarily driving value necessarily, but it was always nice to know for brand equity if you were being at the top of the page or not. Um, I think that this is more indicative of what Google is trying to do. Um, the most recent changes to uh, top of page, uh, top of impression share, those kind of new metrics are kind of, it just black boxes more and more information, uh, which is kind of frustrating. But as we know, the value of average position is still pretty in indistinguishable. Um, Average position is just that, it's average position. Uh, having the, the sig fig of that is, is still kind of tough to quantify. Of course, we always be, we want to be number one, but we all we want to be at the top of the results page, and those are not always the same. So it's unsurprising that they're taking away. I'm interested to know what other uh, core metrics are going to remove from us, but more likely than not, it just kind of disrupted our reporting needs. So we're happy. I'm, we're still catching it, which is grand, but. I can understand some frustrations of why it went away. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Sean. Um, so another question that we have here, uh, regarding what you said about A and B testing, uh, how should we be testing our ads then? There are, there are reasons why we've done it this way in the past and mm -hmm. shown its effectiveness. Absolutely, so and by no means am I suggesting to stop the type of testing that you're doing, but rather think about the results towards significant that it creates. Uh, my final slide, I was talking about doing that ABR testing and always having a responsive ad live alongside your copy. I think my best recommendation would be go look up uh, Martin Rodenkirchen's uh, PPC Epiphany blog and read about it. Um, his presentation at uh, HeroCon London was just phenomenal because it really thinks about how we're doing our testing. When it comes to significance, there are oftentimes, yes, this ad is going to be more effective than the rest, but significance comes and it changes, it goes. So like trying to cross the finish line, and that's what it was really about, needs to be reevaluated. If you keep asking the same question again and again, you're eventually gonna find a pattern. If you look for a pattern long enough, you're eventually going to find it, and this doesn't necessarily drive value when it comes to our ad copy. Instead, we need to think about what is really gonna drive the value proposition for our customer how can we be more persuasive? And that's something that I think we forget about in terms of digital advertising, is that this is all based on persuasion. We are trying to convince a customer who has an attention span of 0.7 seconds on a SERP to click our ad instead of, instead of someone else's. On desktop, people are using, they're still using the F mo moment to go down a page. On mobile, you have, I think, microseconds before someone starts to scroll. We have just a brief amount of time to catch someone, which is why PLAs are so crucial. That image is something that really drives people. And it's all about persuasion. So looking at ad copy and doing that micro adjustment, that little management of, hey, we updated your ad copy. Well, that's grand. What was the effect of conversions? Well, you know, we're, we're still stagnant. It didn't have much effect despite the ad having a statistically significant higher click-through rate or something along those lines. It just think about the metrics that you're using and think about what qualifies as something succeeding. And that's what I was trying to to get across. Um, once again, like reading more about that subject is is great. Uh, he's got so much data that backs it up to say, hey, it's kind of just a moot point. Um, but that's, so don't stop A-B testing. Always have your ads, you know, running in parallel with each other to see what's going to go up. But just keep in mind of when you say, this is the best one, just keep that in the front of your mind for the next couple of tests you're running. Okay, thank you, Sean. Um, so I think we only have a few more minutes left, so I think we only have time for maybe one more question. Um, so 
Let's see, any insights on how we can improve the quality of traffic we're bringing in? Oh, um, the, okay, so, so the quality of traffic? Um, mm -hmm. Okay, this time I didn't discuss it all today, but it was actually your negative keyword strategy. Um, your negative keyword strategy needs to be that, a strategy, something that's gonna be informed, um, rather than just trying to clear out the noise amongst the signal. Um, I think something to do would be to dig into your campaigns and see where in the funnel you're uh, collecting viewers and, and customers to your website, and then start to change ad copy based on the metrics that you find are most relevant to you and work in that direction. So change the, rather than having a negative keyword list, but actually have a strategy, um, have a multi-tiered system where you're driving certain searchers into different landing pages and have a, a CPC strategy that aligns with that. Um, getting a qualified traffic, I mean, that's a million dollar question, but we also want to ensure that we're getting in front of the right customer at the right time, which is why adopting some of those smart campaigns can be, um, can be so effective. Okay. Um, well, I think, okay, Sean, if you can answer this one in just a couple of minutes, um, I, I want to at least get this one in there, and then, because uh, we have just a couple of minutes left, is there a better way to monitor ad copy? It takes so much time. Um, outside of using a, a tool, um, there's not much. It's a very hard process. Using the ad planner is a very difficult thing, so which is why I suggest using that word cloud feature. It just pulls out the market trends um, a little bit quicker. What I've done in the past is rather than spot checking live ads, um, which is again a manual taxing process, is you really have to lean into a tool. Uh, you really need to use something that can automate and move the system forward. And that's really what competitive intelligence is all about, is knowing at any given time what your competition is doing. Otherwise, it just becomes competitive trivia. It just becomes that little blip on the radar rather than something that can sustainably and continuously move the needle forward. Okay, great. Well, thank you, Sean, um, and thank you, everyone. Uh, that's really all the time we have for today. Um, we appreciate you attending today's Help My SEM Campaigns Have Flatlined, Seven Steps to Jumpstart Performance. Uh, if you have any other questions, I think on the next slide there, uh, please contact Sean O'Connor via email. Um, his information is listed. On behalf of Athena and our presenter, thank you for joining us today and have a great rest of your day. Thanks, everyone.